Welcome to KI and Goldie. And well done to those of you who come down from Brisbane, as if you have come from Brazil. Some from Malaysia. Good on you, Ken. Okay, so uh, can we please thank Pastor Suzette and her team, Danny and the others who put this on their own accord? <laughs> Also, uh, I'd like to welcome our special guest speaker, Merlene, who uh, is an extremely busy lady, juggling all kinds of things. She manages the administration for over 30 companies in the Paladin Group. Uh, she's a managing director of a big health club in Canberra. She's running the administration back end of the KI website, and she's coaching and doing all sorts of stuff. So please make her welcome. Pastors and church leaders here, guys? Pastors, church leaders? Huh? Abandon us? Yeah, oh, good, thank you. <laughs> yes, I know. So, welcome to the pastors. We always want to welcome you guys separately. Any new people that are here for the first time, please? Okay, quite a few. About 10 or 12, 13, 15. Okay, excellent. All right, well, I'll just give you a, a short little explanation. Uh, uh, actually, what I'll do is I'll tell you what we're going to do tonight first, all right? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain to you a little bit about KI and where we are up to uh, around the world and with the website and so on. And for the new folks, I'll just give you a very tiny history of who we are and what we are. You can always log on the website and see that later. Um, and then we have got one speaker, who's Liz, who's going to come and talk to us. She's got a 10-minute slot. She's going to show us the stuff, that, the amazing things that she's doing out in the bush. Um, and then, okay, and then after that I will do the first message. And I'm going to talk about the broader vision of God um, that He has for our society, how this ties in with His system of values and how it should tie in with ours, and how inseparable this is from our businesses, okay? And all of it, all of the above in the context of the upcoming federal election. Alright, then we'll have a coffee break and Berlin will come and talk. You can ask her questions and then I'll have Pastor Suzette to pray for us. We should be done by about 9.30, okay? That's, the, that's what's going on for tonight. Um, just to let the new people know, my covering, I go to the City Edge Church on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, this is my 19th year there. And uh, my covering comes from Senior Pastor Paul and Kate Bartolo and their leadership, okay? They know where I am anywhere in the world at any time. And they are my accountability line as well. So they make sure I'm not making up stories and campaigning in the name of God against the taxation office or something like that. <laughs> I don't think we should. Sure. Okay, for the new folks, just so you understand Kingdom Investors, um, we started off uh, really about 2003, 2004, just as a small little church uh, ministry, business ministry, which grew, outgrew our church simply because we changed the format to how it is and changed the genre of ministry. And it outgrew our church. People came from all over the country. Pastor Suzette was one of the early ones bringing people from here. And so we had to split out into different um, chapters around the country and actually around the world. <clears throat> um, it got way too big for what we could handle because we're still trying to run uh, companies and so on. So we recently built a website. We began to film all the uh, previous lectures that we've done over the last sort of 14 years or so. And uh, we, we did that in such a way that those lectures are filmed and mostly out in the marketplace. Um, so quite a few guys have joined that website. It is a subscription site. It's $20 a month. We play for KI everywhere else in the world. Pastor Suzette's and uh, Open Heaven pays for this one. But all the others we pay for cost millions of dollars a year to run KI all over the world and all the initiatives that it funds. But on the website, we decided to charge 20 bucks a month so we can get commitment from the members because we want to create a sheep nation on earth. Which I'll explain shortly, and also to commit us because when you're running, you know, a group of over 30 companies and a massive worldwide ministry to, to commit to going and filming and doing webinars and blogs and blogs and all the other weird, wonderful things we have to do, it's a big commitment. And I would just go, Jens, get on and do it. But now that people are paying, I have to do it. Well, they need to be they shout at me. So, anyway, so that's what we've done, and the website has been exceptionally successful. Okay, we've had more success in the nine or eight months that the website's been up. Literally, they're having 14 years of auditorium lecture around the world. Okay, to the extent the other day, uh, last, late last month, we did the monthly webinar. We did one in the morning, one in the evening, just for the Eastern and Western Hemisphere time zones. And um, I did it on a Wednesday. Usually we do it on a Thursday. And 
So many people, Wednesday people doing it on the Wednesday because that's their pray day. We've taught that we should all have a day to go and pray for a whole day. Well, they all winch because they're called to take on Wednesdays for pray days. And I suddenly start with a webinar. So that is such a good thing that people are employing the teaching. And that's my point. So it's really, really good. Okay, so since we last met, I think it's about six months since I've been here. Um, we did that epic climb into the walls of Jerusalem National Park to, to do that, to go and film uh, messages. I think it was when it was intimacy leads to obedience. That message on the website. Um, we're going to carry that studio up those mountains, 5,000 feet. It's snow. And, and every day it snowed and rained and hailed and sunshine. Just like every half hour it just changed. So we did all that and then we had to go to South Africa. It was KI in Durban for the first time. Um, then we went to South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, and filming all of SAS guys because we're doing a series on knowing your enemy. So that's quite a long a series to film. I hope to get it up around about the middle of the year. We'll go back and film a few more of them. Quite strange uh, in Africa. You know, I come from there, and quite a few you guys come from there. The, there's not a lot of understanding of who the actual enemy is, who, what creates the uh, social distress, the starvation, the corruption, all the issues that go on there. Um, there's always this blame on colonialism, on, uh, you know, when, when Africa was colonized, and the identity of indigenous folks were stolen, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I was asked to talk in Durban to a group, these are plus $100 million families, so cartels almost. They were so fed up with the corruption in Durban, which is South Africa's second city, city now. So, so fed up, I said, please come and talk to us. How do we fix the corruption? You guys are lecturing on, lecturing on all around the world. And one of the guys there, Patrick Kawana, uh, is a Zimbabwean guy, black Zimbabwean guy, a native Zimbabwean, who I met at an economic summit in uh, San Francisco. So we hit it off really well, and he said, please come and talk to these people. How do we fix Durban? And so I said them in, in the opening address, what do you think the problem is? Corruption. Why? And, 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 and why is there so much of this? And what does it lead to? And explain all the crime and everything else that goes with it. Extortion, you know, all the stuff that goes with it. Um, and eventually we boiled it right down to the fact that it comes from the white colonial era, the apartheid system and so on. So, 100% agree that the apartheid system was horrific. I went to school there and my brain's been down to talk to black kids because I came from up in Zambia and I knew black kids. And I got beaten up for doing that. So I understand all that system. But that isn't the problem, okay? The problem is greed and self-centeredness, maximizing self-interest at the expense of others. In that instance, it was white people plundering black people. But that was just a phase of history. You go further back, and I took them back to 1400 years earlier than that, when the Arab slave trade started, which only ended in 1960, by the way, just the other day. That's when it officially ended, and it hasn't even ended, they're still doing it. But the point is, Arabs dressed in skirts, like sheets, came down from the, the Middle East region to come and get slaves for the harems, okay? Young girls and young boys. And they can't, can't possibly catch Africans in West Africa. Indigenous guys in the bush, they're never going to catch them. So how did they get them? The black guys caught them. So black people plundered black people. There was nothing to do with white people in those days. The transatlantic slave trade started, of course. That went on for several hundred years. But, and that was exactly the same thing. The black people had to catch the slaves and sell them to maximize their own self-interest. And the white people took them to maximize their and slave them and run the, the economy of the UK and so on. So the whole thing always comes back to we and self-centeredness. It's not a race issue. All right? Once they understood that, we were then able to say, okay, now we can pour money into the problem, not just down the hole of colonialism because it never works. There's been billions of dollars behind Africa. Nothing's been fixed because we're not dealing with the problem. So that's how we were uh, discussing things in Durban. I accepted it all part of it. Incidentally, over 180 million African slaves left for Arabia. Only 10 million left during the transatlantic slave trade. I say only, I mean 10 million is a lot. But the point is the distinction between the two. One of them took 180 million, no white people involved. The other one took 10 million, lots of white people involved. Okay, so it's not a race thing. Okay. Of the uh, New Zealand, KI New Zealand for the first time. Uh, recently, Network 120, which is a group of uh, churches in the INC movement. So I had asked to lecture and mentor to 31 pastors, so I did about two weeks ago. Then we're at the Christian Federation. 
launching a vision for them because Christian Federation doesn't really have a national vision, and of course we do with the Sheep Nation concept. Um, and then all the other local KI events. Tomorrow in Jakarta, we're going to do a six hour KI conference uh, on Saturday and talk to two churches on Sunday, and they, and they don't give you five seconds off. It's like every, do everything there's a dinner, there's these people to speak to, and it just goes on and on. Beirut, back to New Zealand in May. USA several times, Nigeria this year, Mexico, Argentina, Peru, Netherlands. These are all the countries that we're lecturing in this year. Lecturing a lot, not just like one session, it's like six hours of KR. So by the end of it, we're totally drained. But the point is, we are steadily creating a worldwide movement. And that's the key. You know, we will create sheep nations on Earth. This is the first one, Australia, as you know, I've said this many, many times. And there's good reason why we are so far ahead of the rest of the world because we've been saturated with this teaching and people see that it works and people engage in it. Okay? And just by looking at the feedback the other day from all those people taking prey days, that's just the beginning, that's the beginning of it. You know, if you want to get a relationship with God, you want to get his favor, you've got to build a relationship and you better be doing a whole day. We just know that from experience. Okay? So that's really I wanted to just update you where we all are. For those uh, guys who don't want to join the website, that's fine. The, the KI chapters like this one will still carry on for the time being. Um, but I, I can assure you the hard thing is when we talk at a conference like this, or even like this, you just get the sort of tip of the iceberg of the teaching. Because we only have like 40 minutes each to teach and there's, there's two speakers. But if you were a member of the website, you went on to it, you will go, go into real depth and see the teaching and then see it applied in the marketplace and so on. And that's why there's so much uh, momentum now over the last eight months of that. And of course the webinars where we can interact and answer questions. Okay? So, Liz, where are you, please? Can you come up here, young lady? Liz is going to tell us about some amazing stuff that she's doing in the bush looking after farmers and so on. So please make her welcome. Well, thank you everyone for having me tonight. Um, Suzette and David and Berlin, thank you so much. And I guess my heart tonight is that I could inspire in you an understanding and a passion for the state of our rural producers across our nation. Um, there's been support in bursts from the media and big fundraisers and things like that, and they last for a few weeks. But the ongoing, uh, and everyone loses the side of it because they're busy about their own things. But these ongoing uh, tragedies and hardships have been going on across our nation from right back uh, in the early 2000s. There's been drought stricken regions across our nation and people suffering because of that. And so I guess I'm going to jump straight in tonight and just begin to uh, tell you a few things. I've just got a few slides here that will give you a bit of a visual about what it looks like in a drought stricken region then hopefully uh, tell you some stories about real life situations that you can't take photos of, but you can impart the uh, depth of the pain of the people involved. So, um, uh, this is a map that shows the regions I now cover, not all at once in any given year. Uh, the Lord spoke to my heart when he gave me the downloaded the vision and said, pitch your tent at Dolby, and uh, I will wait upon me and I will show you which roads to go down. So that was back in 2006. I had an unair conditioned Hyundai Excel, a tent, and $4,000 worth of spiritual food for the people because the Lord said, take spiritual food. And I want you to take the love of God and shed it in the highways and the byways of our nation. And there's people waiting for you. They've got their hands outstretched. They're so thirsty to receive what you're bringing for them, bringing to them. Uh, I, I then uh, graduated to a camper trailer, which I've had for six years, and I've just found that recently, in the heat, uh, to be harder to put up or pull down, when all I want to focus on is the needs of the people, so it uh, takes away from what I'm doing when I have to focus putting that up and down. It's been a great blessing for the years I've had it, but it gets very hot. Um, that's just a signpost, the typical signpost of roads that I travel down that often, very often unsealed. There's families all around the, along those roads. That's all property name 
names, these people tucked away are very often suffering in silence. Many of the ones that need help the most are the ones that won't put their hand up for help. And that's what I find to be tragic and unacceptable. And this northeast, south and west, this is a girl sent me these photos. This was been her vision from her homestead for the last seven years. So that's facing north, east, south, west and south. And so if we could imagine ourselves living in that kind of situation for seven years with the hopelessness and dying cattle and everything that engenders, um, I don't know whether we'd make it. That's just more drought stricken country. And that's a little um, marketplace booth I had uh, at a town called Bar Calden. The chairman of the um, Agricultural Show Committee invited me to have a stand there. So, of course, it was the only Christian anything anywhere in sight. And, um, but you'd be absolutely astounded at the number of people who wanted to have a chat. I sat, sat way back from the table and prayed. And those people were free to roam all the materials. And um, then they would come over for a chat. I was just praying and asking God, you know, who needed help. Um, this is a family that's uh, um, my teammates on the ground at Winton. We really, um, Winton would be one of the hardest places I've ever struck spiritually. There's been a wonderful little church going there for many years with about 10 people. But this family has a backbone of it. And they have a cattle property. They've just lost a third of their livestock in the floods. They had droughts, now they've had floods. Um, but they're really good people with me and they really help me. That's a family of eight children and their mum and dad that I met right in the hardest of circumstances. She was expecting her eighth child. She had blood clots, they were on a very isolated road, probably, I think it was 14 hours from Alice Springs where she was having the baby. And she was full of blood clots and that girl went in with the mail cart to Tennant Creek and got a bus all the way to Alice Springs and she never complained, not one word. And, and she had a daughter after all those boys. <laughs> this one's just sitting in a drought stricken paddock with um, a couple and we had bread and spam for lunch. We were sitting in amongst the cow dung and the, under a tree and there was no, no grass there whatsoever. And these are, the cat, uh, these are their cattle but they're only that looking that good because they are exceptionally good managers. Now this excites me. That's just a bookcase to you, isn't it? But that bookcase is in a man's camp that I've prayed into for five years at Cloncurry. It's a mining camp uh, dining room. And that dining room has now got a bookcase full of God's materials in there. And I had a meeting with the manager recently and he's opened the door for me to come in and speak because God gave me this vision years ago to come and speak to those young men like a mother to sons and nail all the things that go along with fly in, fly out uh, workers. And um, it's such a, it's such a, it nearly doubles me over with compassion when I start dreaming about what I'm going to say. And I had prayed for him the night before he was quite unwell. And I prayed for this young man and he said, I'll meet you in the morning and we'll talk about what you want to do. Well, I hardly had to say a thing. That young man said, yes, we can do this. He said, no, I can bring you in under, um, what was it? Are you okay with or something? Oh, are you okay? I can bring you in under that. And I said, I wouldn't like to do it in this great big dining room, but I'd like to have it in a more confined space. And he said, yes, we can do it in the mess hall and I'll put up the signs and everyone will know you're coming. But for years, I've put word for today in a special letter into that uh, place and a young woman went and uh, purchased the bookcase for me and set it all up and I led her to the Lord. She was the uh, manager's PA and so she's my mate and helper in that area. Now this is gardening. This is, imagine if this was us. This is gardening in the outback. Look at the smile on that girl's face. That's the best you can do with what she's got. So those few drought plants is what keeps her going. She loves her garden. Now this little boy here, he has a story. I met this family way out southwest of Coolpe, um, about, I reckon it must have been 10 years ago. And uh, that particular day, uh, they were clearing virgin ground to plant an orchard. And so I volunteered to, 
with the twins who were 13 or 14 at the time to stick pick all this. Do you know what stick picking is? Getting all the roots and the branches and everything out of the ground so they can plow it. And the object of this lesson was that we wouldn't stop until we finished the job. And the boys, they sort of knocked up about, I don't know, about two o'clock. And so I just said, no, come on, we're going to finish this. And out we went, and my face is as red as a carrot um, because I wouldn't stop. And these kids, right from back then, they learned a lesson that we must finish a task. Um, a few years later, this little boy, oh, this makes me, uh, he was bitten in his bed by a brown snake at night. Bit him multiple times on his hand. Now that is recovering there, that is nearly better. But we walked with that family for so many months to see that boy. His life was hanging in the balance. Uh, if his mum wasn't a nurse, uh, he would not have made it to Charleville Hospital. It was too difficult for them. They flew him to Toowoomba. Nobody could help there, so they flew him to the Royal Brisbane Wiggles Hospital, where they had a snake bite specialist there. But by this time, he was very far gone. Um, he was in an induced coma for 11 days, and all the toxins were poisoning um, his system. So, um, so there he is today, and he now has his pilot's license. So this year, we're just going to add, we're increasing and increasing um, our circulation of word for today, saturating country towns. Um, and then I follow that up by visiting people. Um, they ring me and we talk, and then when we go out there, they invite me to visit. And God is just spreading the gospel across our nation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz. She's a good speaker, right? Urgently needs a caravan. Air conditioned caravan. Okay, I just want to set this up with the very good one company that I work with. It's good.
they Skype and they Zoom and they WhatsApp and some people use that thing called the telephone as well, old-fashioned ones. But they all want to dialogue, you know, and just other ways they're in distress which is why they come. And I just ask a few leading questions. I try to glean the info out of them and then form an opinion to help them. I've only got an hour with each one. Not a profit or anything like that, but it's had a lot of experience of analysing what's going on. So, um, when I get to the end of that hour, if I'm sort of stuck and I don't understand what is the reason for their dilemma, I always ask them how did they vote at the last state election and the last federal election. Many of them can't remember. I, I ask them, you know, well, which party did you vote for and who was your candidate and did they stand for abortion and safe schools and freedom of religion and euthanasia and stuff like that or against it or what, what was their, what did they do and, and what did they stand for What did, who did you vote for? Usually they cannot remember. Some of the more sophisticated ones can, but most of them can't. They'll say, well, I'm traditionally I vote you know, conservative or I vote Labour or whatever. But that's all. And so therein lies a big problem. Because if they have voted for someone whose who's policy and who stands up against God's principles, they are then complicit. They have to be. They voted it in. They voted against God's will. So why would God prosper their business? It's not logical. You know, he would rather stand them down and get their attention and have somebody point things out to them, perhaps. Okay? So it's quite surprising that that goes on. If we look at the one scripture that we're all going to remember, it's Deuteronomy 8 and 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord. But remembering the Lord when we vote is so important. Uh, the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he might establish his covenant, his covenant which he swore to his fathers as it is this day. Okay, so he's establishing a covenant in the earth. We have to remember that with everything that we do. And that's why he's given us the power to pray for it. Okay, just to associate with the covenant. And then it goes to verse 19. And it shall be, if thou dost, or if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, such as greed and self centeredness and serve them and worship them, I will testify to you this day that you shall surely perish. So in other words, you are going to be working against me, the Lord, is what he's saying. Okay? So the covenant that he's referring to is all about Abraham's children. Alright? And uh, how the Lord would give Abraham a place to live, and how he would give him squillions of children and offspring and descendants, and how they would create a, a nation that would worship the one God. Right? So God's covenant was all about children, and children's children flourishing, and if you're voting against that covenant, such as voting for people who stand for abortion, and I'm going to show you some interesting pictures in a minute, not pictures of abortion going on, pictures of who voted for what, okay? Then there are going to be consequences, and that's what verse 19 is telling you. There's going to be consequences if you don't remember me, the Lord, alright? So, I really, really, really don't want anybody in this room to be negatively impacted by your vote. We have to be on, we have to understand this and grasp what God's vision on earth might be. Now, I know uh, it's a federal election coming up, and abortion, which is where, where I'm leaning on this simply because it's an example. It's a good example because there's a lot of history behind it. I know abortion is a state issue, um, and we've got a federal election coming, but I'll, I'll deal with that in a minute and I'll explain why they are actually linked. Okay, but at KI we're all about growing our businesses to bring the kingdom of God into the earth, and the overarching strategy, as I said, is to create a sheep nation. So it's not just about building profit and, uh, and hoarding assets for ourselves. Obviously, those are just tools to do what we have to do. So we have to, therefore, because we I'm talking about God's broader picture on the earth, we have to remember that every single day. So when I get up in the morning, I go praying at 4 o'clock, I disappear out into uh, yeah, nicely in the dark, I've got a little cottage up there, I go pray there for an hour. The first thing is I take communion, because that's how I remember God every single day. Remember me. For I gave the power to pray for Even now, in my bag, pack for Jakarta tomorrow is my communion. Okay, it goes everywhere because I'm not going to get it in the hotel. Unless I go and buy a big bottle of wine, which is sometimes a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you know, um, guys, this is this whole thing, it's it's a uh, granny sheep nation is a supernatural undertaking. It's not an easy thing to do. So we need the supernatural to do it. And that comes from God, so we better be on his side better make sure he's on our side, okay? So that's why I do that every day. And that means obviously staying within his value system and keeping in our mind that children, children's children and so on is where all of our posterity is God's value system. So we have to remember that money or 
organizations. So I want to just do a, a really short history of this so that we see where it happens in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, and where it's happening today, and then apply that to how we vote and expect to see results in our business. Remember, one of the first things the Lord said to Adam, the first man, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Populate the earth. You've got to have kids to do that. Right. But straight away it's establishing the values. Then, another major milestone, Noah, because we wiped out Noah's left. Be fruitful, Noah. Um, multiply and replenish the earth with people. Okay? Have kids, lots of them. So the kids straight away are the value system. The value. Then he told Abraham, I'll give you so many children, they will outnumber the stars and the sand and so on and so on. Let's have a look at jo Joseph in Egypt. Here's Genesis 41, 52. And the name of the second son he called Ephraim. This is Joseph named his kid, second kid. So the name of the second son he called Ephraim. Uh, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Straight away, he's, he's regarding fruitful as his children. Ephraim means doubly fruitful. Now understand what's going on at the time. They're in the midst of seven years of plenty. They have so much wealth, they've collapsed the entire accounting system. No one can even count what they have. His mindset is not on that one. It's on these kids. So that is so crucial for us to understand that. So, obviously, in Egypt, these Israelites did what they were told, and they bred, and they had kids, because that was where they, their values lay, and they had lain for, for centuries. And, of course, they outbred the Egyptians. The Egyptians had become, had become really lazy. I'm not going to go into the type of nations, but if you study where the different peoples went, the, the Hamitic peoples, who are actually the Egyptians, and the, and the Semitic peoples who came from Shem, you'll see different work ethics. Right? So, but the point being that at this point in history, these Egyptians were lazy, they were opulent, and they were flaunting their wealth all the time. Um, a culture of pride is probably the best way to describe it, and that is always a really, really dangerous culture to have. Probably look at the Kardashians and the rest of the United States these days. I'm in the States a lot, and I tell you, it troubles me the pride and the flaunting of wealth. Okay? How do I know that they were, they were, they were opulent and flaunting the wealth? Just remember the, the, the whole deal that went on during the seven years of plenty and then the seven years of famine. Uh, Joseph taxed um, the, the, well, the whole of uh, Middle East and North Africa. He taxed that whole region 20%. So he doubled the tax, already made 10. He doubled the tax to 20. That means that the 20% that he drew in collapsed the accounting system because it was so much. They couldn't count 20%. What happened to the other 80%? That was in the hands of everybody else and they blew it. By the end of the seven years, they had nothing. One year later, they had to come groveling for food. And then they had to spend what little bit of money they had. So they had blown four times as much as collapsed, collapsed the accounting system. So that was the nature and the culture of what was going on in those days. And that was one of the reasons why John, uh, Joseph had actually enslaved them for a period of time, teach them a lot of stuff. He actually let them go and go to the land back afterwards. Okay, so that, uh, this, this went on, of course, after Joseph had died. The Israelites carried on accumulating wealth and accumulating children, and they outbred the Egyptians. So they became more numerous than the Egyptians and more wealthy. And so this worried the Egyptians. Now Joseph's dead, the, the, uh, that Pharaoh's died, and with several hundred years are, are going by, and the Egyptians are really worried about this, and they start to enslave these guys. And that, that's fine up to a period of time. All of a sudden, a few hundred years later, Pharaoh makes an incredibly fatal mistake. He decides to kill the male children. And that's when God took action. Okay? So what happened there? I'm not sure how much background you know in the Bible. There's some good scholars in here. But the head of the Egyptian sacred scribes, he had a vision, probably from the devil. And he spoke to Pharaoh and he said, there is one who will rise up, a really, really handsome, good-looking guy, big in stature and so on. He will rise up and he will lead the Israelites against us. So we have to fix this. Now, understand what's going on there as well. These scribes are very wealthy people. Obviously, the Pharaoh is wealthy. They don't want any threat to what's going on. Greed and self-centeredness dominates, always, okay? So, they deliberately set about a structured, selected program, or selected program of population control. They decided that by culling the male children, A, they'll get rid of this guy that's going to lead the Israelites against them, and B, they'll stop them breeding. They will, they will actually stop this breeding program that's going on. Totally against God's culture and totally against the Israelites' culture. So, of course, the whole thing collapses. 
you know, the, and it was actually the killing of the babies that triggered the Lord to say, I'm going to fix this. And then 40 years later, he brings Moses back and, and the Exodus begins. Okay? Understand, guys, that God has a history of wiping out those who go against that fundamental value system. There's a history of that. And you know that from what happened in Egypt. Look what happened to their kids. Okay? Alright, so it's an elementary principle. Now, also note the way this was packaged. It was packaged by the sacred scribes to the Pharaoh that this was a threat to Pharaoh's wealth and everything, and the labor system that they had. So, if, if we don't fix this, you're going to lose all your wealth. So, but the point is greed and self centeredness took precedence over God's principles. And we will see that happening today. Okay, so obviously, out goes the Exodus, and you guys know the story, we've spoken about it in the past. As the Hebrews are crossing the desert, as the Israelites are crossing the desert, the Amalekites begin to pick off the children and the women at the back. Straight away, if you read again the background to the Bible, you will find in their mindset that these, these Israelites had outbred the Egyptians and they were now heading to Canaan and they were going to outbreed us all in Canaan. And their work ethic was such they will outwork us. So we better start killing them before they get there. And straight away they went after the children because they were the stragglers at the back. But in the end, that wasn't working. So as you know, they came around the front of the Rephidium and they attacked them and then the Lord said to Moses, get Joshua out there and go and wipe them out. Okay? And that, the Lord was so concerned that he said to Moses, and make sure, because this is only, a, this is only part of their army, the rest of them in Canaan, and they were a very dominant race in Canaan. Don't forget, they were actually overran Egypt at one point, became the, the, um, the pharaohs themselves. But the point is, the Lord said to Joshua, uh, so to Moses, tell Joshua afterwards, when this battle's over, he's got to wipe that whole nation out. Because they are trying to kill the, 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 Egyptian, uh, the Hebrew children. And they went on killing those children in the Promised Land for years and years after that. Okay? So, my point being, again, here you have this big package that these people are going to help breed us. We have to wipe them out because they're going to disrupt our lifestyle. So let's go 1400 years into the future, and we're going to the first century Palestine, where as you know, we spoke about this before, uh, everybody is starving, children are being sold off as slaves so they could just survive, um, and trafficking is going on, and that kind of stuff always gets God's attention. So, here we have it being foretold by the shepherds that this guy Jesus is about to be born, and he's going to bring peace, great joy, and goodwill to all mankind. And then you also have the wise men saying the king of Jews has just been born and we're going to go and worship him. Alright, so of course this is totally counterculture to what's going on. So Herod the Great, the temple priests, and all of the corruption and brutality that goes with that, it was in their interest to keep the people as slaves. They did not want goodwill and peace to all mankind and prosperity and stuff like that. That's absolutely not what they want. It was, it was a threat to their wealth and so on. Okay? So they, they packaged it up as, you know, this guy, this person being born is a less day or a bandit uh, who's going to disrupt our society, it's going to cause the wrath of the Romans to come upon us. So they set about once again killing the babies, as you know. So Herod the Great goes after all the male children. This is selective uh, population control once again. All right, so he's into it. Again, packaged so that they can look after their own self-interest, which is their excuse for doing it. You know, I don't know if you know what happened here. So King Herod's been on the throne for 37 years. Okay, Herod the Great. Quite healthy. But all of a sudden, he struck down with the most painful and putrefying illness that nobody even knows what it was to this day. They haven't figured what it is, they're attacking Okay? He was so in so much pain, he tried to suicide, stabbing himself and stabbing himself. His cousins actually pulled him up and stopped. You know, managed to save him for a few more months. But within a year, he was dead. So the Lord does not, my point is, is not going to tolerate the killing of children for our, for our greedy self sacrifice okay? So such was the anger of the Lord. Problem is, ladies and gents, uh, we've again packaged it up and we're doing it again. In particular, in Queensland, with our new abortion uh, laws, and Jackie Tran has, has brought nicely for us, okay? And it's packaged up as a threat to the freedom of girls, you know, freedom of choice, and why should anybody tell me what to do with my body? So it's not packaged as murdering, dismembering, late-term fetuses, which they call them fetuses, but these are children. Yeah. These are children. You can, you can, if they were outside of the womb, they would survive. 
Okay, of course they need support, but so do as a newborn baby. Okay? Again, I mentioned earlier that abortion is a state issue, we've got a federal election coming up. But Medicare is, is Commonwealth money, and Medicare is funding these abortions now. Okay? The sex selected abortions, I've alluded to this twice now, where the, where the boys were killed in our modern era, um, it's the girls that are being killed. Because in certain cultures around the world, and those cultures come to Australia, they select which, which sex they want. It's almost always the one boys because they're more valuable to the family. So you're finding that in lots of countries around the world, and even here in Australia, there is sex selection going on with the abortion. It's not publicised, but it's there big time. Okay? That is funded by the federal government. The, the abortion drug RU486, funded by the federal government, even though it's incredibly harmful. I think there's over 800 recorded cases of women who have nearly died from this thing. That, yeah, that's okay, you know, you can have it for free now. Again, it's a federal issue. Okay, so we must link the two. There's a federal election coming, we need to know what are our candidates stand for. It's no good saying what does the party stand for, because what happens if all the parties stood for abortion? Then you'd be stuck between a rock and a hard place. You have to know what your candidate stands for, or candidates, there's never just one, and then go looking for the ones that Jesus would want in power. Okay, so it's up to us to be talking to the candidates. And again, as I said earlier, if you vote for the wrong person, you are complicit. Okay, you're not remembering God, the Deuteronomy 818. Remember the Lord, you're actually not remembering Him, and therefore, why should He give you the power to create wealth? Therefore, why should the business prosper? Because you're not establishing His covenant, you're working against His covenant. Okay, so the, the, the late term abortions, uh, guys, make no mistake, this has been done to score votes. That's why it's done. It is just populist politics. That's what it is. It's no benefit to the nation at all. It's seriously detrimental if we kill 100,000 children a year. Okay? Unbelievable numbers. And that's just the beginning. Now it's free and legal. Okay? So the people who brought this savage policy have, have no visual concept of what does it look like, what goes on, because it's so well packaged. That of, you know, to do with being freedom and so on. But again, it's, a, it's actually self-centeredness that is, that is taking uh, precedence over God's principles. Because I'm so self-centered, I'm not going to go through this pregnancy, and I'm not a girl, okay, so it's a hard thing. But that doesn't matter. It's still a human life, and we've still got to understand what God's all on about. Okay? So there's no discussion on the debate of how doctors do this. Um, all of that is avoided and shouted down if you try and open your mouth because it's too horrific. I'll show you a slide. This is so you understand who voted for who. Okay, so these 41 uh, Queensland State MPs voted against Labor's route of abortion to birth law. So this was uh, produced at the, the Church and State were there the other day, probably? No? Okay, if any of you guys were at the Church and State Conference uh, over in Springwood, these are the people that voted against the, um, the late term abortion. So have a look at those. I've done a few, did a little bit of a count on them. I'll actually, I'll go to another slide. There you have uh, the, the for and against. So on the right hand side, these 50 state MPs voted for Labour's extreme abortion to birth law. Now, let's just have a look at this. I'm not looking for gender wars here, guys, but I want to just so you understand how it's packaged. Uh, on the right hand side, 81% of women voted for it. Now, think about this because typically it's the women who are much more matriarchal than men are patriarchal. Okay, women are better mothers than men are fathers, put it that way. That's just the way it works because they might uh, obviously incubate the babies and so on. But the point is 81%, of, that's how good the packaging is. It's crazy. Only six of them out of those women there voted no. Okay, so uh, oh, six women on this side voted no. Um, 
The men, 26 voted yes, so 42% of men voted yes. Of the, of the whole thing there. So it's quite a big difference. I'm not saying the men are so good or anything like that, I'm simply saying it's the packaging that the enemy uses to sell it to us. And it's not only abortion, it's all sorts of other things. Okay, but I want to tell you something, guys. There's good news, okay? It, it's, it, it is fixable. It's entirely doable. Um, I think I might have told this story here once before, I don't know if you would remember. But years ago, I was lecturing um, uh, in a country, and there was a, an audience of about 800 people there. It was actually in Malaysia, I think. About 800 people there. And I felt, I was doing KI, and I felt that um, the Lord was telling me that in this room of Christians, mostly Christians, um, there were doctors who were performing abortions for money. They get paid to do this. Obviously, they're not doing it for free. And even when they do it for free in Australia, they're still getting Medicare paid. All right? But that's what the Lord showed me, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't really want to bring that up to my group of people, and you know. But I felt the Lord was on my case, I just felt that I had to. So I wanted to tell them a story about how bad they were, but also about how bad I had been. Because the, the reason, uh, the whole issue of Jesus coming was to forgive people for stuff, right? So that we can get on and change everything. Repent is a big part of it, change our ways. And I wanted these people to change their ways. So I said to them, you know what, I, I, and I have to tell you how bad I was, most of you know this, it doesn't matter. But I, I have to tell you, when I finished in the, in the military, the Special Forces in Rhodesia, uh, in the war there, uh, the last two years that I was there, I became mercenary. Well, we were called irregulars, and we weren't called mercenaries because I was not palatable. So we were irregulars, okay? So I was invited back, I'd left the military, and, I, and, and the Special Branch said to me, you can come back in, and you can uh, you know, take on terrorists, we're gonna, we'll pay you per kill, and we'll pay you for every AK, for every landmine, for every capture, every kill, and so on. And so I did that for two years, and I funded a big competitive fishing company on Lake Kariba. And so I was fighting this war no longer for king and country, so to speak. I was fighting it for greed and self centeredness I was raising funds, it was my first cap raise to fund my fishing company. I knew by then we were going to lose that war. Okay? Politically, we were losing the war. But it didn't matter. It wasn't a Christian. It didn't matter to me. And so I did that. And I was very successful at that. And you know what? When I became a Christian many years later, it took me a long, long time to accept that God was going to forgive me. Because I heard in different churches, I heard a pastor talking, saying, no, God can forgive the drug addict and the alcoholic. And I said, look, I think, good grief. Everyone in Australia is a black and alcoholic. Of course he can. So, you know, he's never going to forgive me. I shot people for money, you know. And then it was a case of, you know, God can forgive you know, the white bash and this and that. And I thought, yeah, okay, but I shot people. And so on and so on. I just went on. I never thought I would get forgiven until one day we're up on the other tablelands and the pastor's talking about Paul. And so the first time I actually went home and read the Bible and looked into Paul and found he was worse than me. He even said so to Timothy that I was the worst of all sinners. And when I went back and looked what he did, he went and hunted and you know, killed the Christians. And he deliberately went after the Christians. And I never went after Christians. I just went after terrorists. And they were armed and shooting back. But, you know, and so my point is I felt a bit better and I was able to actually accept the forgiveness that had been on offer. So I, I, I told this audience that story. And I said, but here in this room, I wasn't a Christian at the time. And these guys were shooting back. And they were killing civilians all the time. They were terrorists, proper terrorists, trained in Russia. Okay? And I was hunting them. You guys are actually killing little babies. And you're accepting money for that. Those babies can't shoot back. Okay, and not only can they not shoot back, you're getting paid for this. You're doing it for money. Not only that, you are a Christian. I was the Christian at the time. You are Christians. You are knowingly doing this. What are you going to say to the Lord when you have to account for your life? And so I just left them and said, okay, I'm set it up before I'm going to get shot by somebody. <laughs> anyway, afterwards, one guy came up, took the mic, and the pastor noticed it. And he said, I run the biggest abortion clinic in this city. And he said, I will never do another abortion, but no, we will change our practice. Another guy came up and he said, we run a big one as well, it's not as big as his one. And I never thought of it like that, it was just a procedure. And so we will change what we do. So that was just those two. I don't know what else went on, what other dialogue went on afterwards. But my point is we can, we can convict people yes. if, we, if we can get their ear. Okay? And so, I don't know how profitable their businesses were, but I was linking what they were doing with the Lord standing their business down. Because he's not going to honor that kind of business, obviously. Alright? 
So there you see. Now, there's lots of other issues, guys, when you're talking to your candidates. We should talk to them. We should phone them up. We should go to a meeting where they're at. Um, in Perth, at KLI next week, we've got a whole bunch of candidates sitting in front of the audience. Each one gets five minutes. Tell us your policies. Then, then there are four questions that get up. What is your stance? Or how will you vote? Not what is your stance. How will you vote on this? Or how did you vote on this issue or that issue? And so on. So there are other issues. There's obviously the, the, the business of religious freedom, freedom of speech, safe schools, euthanasia. There are all issues that the Lord will be concerned about. Okay, I remember Jesus talking to the priest in the synagogue when he was 12 years old, and his parents found him three days later and said, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm here about my father's business. That word business is concerned. That's what he translated, I'm here about my father's concern. And that's what he was talking about. Those priests were plundering the people. He was pinging them for it. Okay? So the entire point of this lesson, guys, is to get you to find out what your candidates stand for and what they will vote for. And that gives you the, the opportunity to decide who to vote. Alright? So because I just really, really want you guys to, to prosper. Um, goat nations kill their babies. Sheep nations nurture their babies. Such a big difference. Sheep nation has to be run by shepherds, is just all the same that I wrote down. Sheep nation has to be run by shepherds. Not errands and not pharaohs. Okay, so that is what we have to vote for, what we have to have in mind. And that is how we remember the Lord, because it was Him who gave us the power to create wealth, to establish His covenant, not to kill His kids. It's the opposite. Okay, let us pray. Almighty God, we are here gathered before you this evening because we know that if we stand together, we can put to flight the whole shooting match, the whole enemy. Lord, it is up to us to endure and to wear down the enemy because we know from the example that Jesus gave straight after he was baptized. He went into the desert and he wore the enemy down. The enemy said, I will be back. The enemy was battered and bruised and gave up. Jesus was battered and bruised and the angels ministered to him straight afterwards, but he then went on with his ministry. We too must endure. We too must take on the devil. Lord, we must stand up and be counted and that we commit to. We will never create a ship nation at all this nonsense is going on. It is the counterculture of the kingdom of God. So Father, I just pray into the hearts of everybody in this room. I pray the prayer that you stated to Joshua when Joshua, before he went into the promise, said, be brave, be brave, be brave, and remember this book of law. So I'm not talking about we must make sacrifices on the altar on Sunday, not that part of the law. I'm talking about the entire part of the law, the caring and sharing, looking after of each other looking after of human life. And Lord, the understanding of where your value systems lie. I pray that into the hearts, right into the hearts of everybody in this room today. And Lord, for anybody that's been involved in abortions, Lord, I just pray for them. I pray that they can understand forgiveness. I pray that they, they can come before you and be forgiven, Lord, and be clean and go ahead with their lives and get on and even use it to campaign against any more of it being done. We honor you in this place, Lord. We just give you all the glory, we acknowledge you as our Father, as our Saviour, and Lord, we just pray, I pray that everybody will take communion every day, so that they can then remember you for the rest of the day, all of their undertakings and all of their enterprise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, let's have a cup of tea before we hear from the greatest speaker on earth. Uh, those are the unresourceful ones. So you can do these things, set the agenda, um, act quickly, show interest, get straight to the point, don't do it down around, just, you know, um, don't provide too much information or talk too much, um, and don't slow down, whatever you do. Because <laughs> they are always in a hurry. Then you've got the influencer. So this is the type of person that wants to be liked. Um, they're the joker, they're the fun ones. Um, so my manager, who's also my sister, is a high, 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 and she never stops talking. <sighs> um, but she's very creative, she's very persuasive, um, very sociable. She's always having morning teas and parties in the club. She raises so much money for breast cancer, I just can't even count it. Um, she does all those kind of feel-good things because she gets her energy from people. She
She loves people and she knows all the members um, and when, when they want to leave the club, they actually feel guilty coming to tell her <laughs> that they've got to leave. <laughs> So um, you can see their ideal roles there, public relations, yeah, she's great. She's a great coach. We have a lot of young girls in the club, um, you know, 18, 19 years old, just starting out their careers. She is a shoulder for them to grow on all the time. All their boyfriend problems, she knows all about them. And <laughs> yeah, she helps them through an awful lot of stuff. Eyes make very good sales people too, because they're just so chatty and they just, um, are open and warm and inviting and um, all they want to do is put the kettle on, pull up a comfy chair and have a chat. Um, oh, let's go back. They are also, as always believe, they are very scatterbrained. They, um, they can go off on a tangent, you know, you'll be talking about something and the next thing the conversation has meandered off all around the countryside and you have to actually bring them back again. Um, so they don't focus on one thing, they're big picture people, they don't want to know detail, they get all excited about new ideas, um, but that's probably where they end, they just stay as ideas. Um, they get very excitable as well. Uh, the what questions are their questions, what do you think of the situation, what do you think could be done better or differently, they respond well to those kind of questions. Um, they will work very hard to maintain that positive, um, positive vibe. I've noticed it, like even if I have a down day, she'll do whatever she can to keep the positivity up and keep everybody happy and smiling and, and keep it going, you know. I'll flip through those. The fears, social rejection being ignored. Um, that could be the worst thing for an eye because they just love people so much and if they think that people don't like them or that they've been left out of anything or that they're being ignored, um, they really don't like it. They don't like to lose influence and they don't like to be insignificant. They want to be the life and soul of the party, um, which is really great. Um, they can be very disorganised, as I said before, um, under pressure. So wrapping up uh, the eye, um, you've got to maintain a positive atmosphere because if you don't, they get really down in the dumps. So I sometimes find that if I'm down in the dumps, it rubs off on her, so I've got to be very careful about that and very mindful as well. Um, don't talk about details, don't fail to socialise, um, don't bring up the negative issues um, and don't isolate them because they just love to be with people. When I recharge my batteries, I have to go away into a quiet place on my own and recharge my batteries. I, um, I can't be with people, it's just overwhelming for me. But she, amazingly, just thrives on it and she, you know, recharges her batteries by being with other people. Um, here we've got the S, so this is me. Um, uh, the S is the one who wants to be comfortable. Wants to be comfortable, wants to be safe, wants to be secure. This is the mother archetype. So this is the one who wants to nurture everybody, love everybody, make sure everybody else is okay. Can often be the doormat um, because people just walk over you because you're just so willing to say yes. So S people have really got to stand up for themselves. They've just got to learn that They've got to stand up for themselves sometimes. Um, that's why they make such good nurses, teachers, social workers, those kind of people. Um, and uh, customer service, because they actually do care about the customers, you know. And in my gym, that's our number one standard. Our number one benchmark is customer service. Um, last year, I did a theme, I chose a theme for the gym um, because we were feeling a little bit out of whack and I decided that I would choose a theme to start us off for the year. So I chose surprise and delight. After a long time thinking about it, I really wasn't sure about this theme thing, but anyway, I thought, no, I'm going to 
Jesus is surprising delight. So I went out and I bought a whole lot of gifts, you know, just little scurvy gifts for about $20 or $30 each and brought them back to the club and we had a girls' party where we all wrapped them up with beautiful paper and ribbons and we got cards and we signed all of the cards um, and we said, we love you, we appreciate you, thank you for being our member. And one day a week, we choose a random day, we will go and put a gift into a locker. And people will come in and they'll come in and give us their card and we give them a locker key. The girls don't know which locker the present is in. And we've had so many women, this has just been such an amazing thing. I never thought that it would have the reaction that it's had. It's just been phenomenal, you know. Um, we had one lady, she takes the card out of the um, locker, because the present is not actually in the locker, it's just the card. She brings the card to reception, where we're all waiting to greet her and give her her gift. And we just make such a bit of fuss of her and, you know, hug her and all that kind of stuff. And this woman at this day, she just stood there and she just broke down and cried. And she said, I just feel like in my life, this is the only place that cares about me. This is where I come, this is my tribe, these are my people, this is where I belong, and I will never be this gym. So that's the kind of reaction that it's been having. It's because a lot of people, a lot of women, come to the gym um, for their me time, um, and also for, just for um, community. We built such a good community of women, supporting women, just by doing little things like this, you know. Um, so that has just been a major thing in the life of the club, and it was only going to go for one year, but I kind of thought, well, how do you top that, you know? <laughs> I've got to think of another um, theme, which I will think of another theme, but, you know, um, uh, yeah, that one's pretty hard to top from the reactions that we got, you know, people on our members page, uh, Facebook, taking pictures of their presents and, and put posting it and all that kind of stuff, it's just amazing. So, um, yeah, so you can see there's a high care factor with S's. Um, on the other hand, I can be very stubborn, um, and so most S people are. They resist new ideas, they don't really like change, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, kind of thing. Um, we will accept change if um, we can see it's going to be for the better. And if you give us enough notice, if you let us know that this is going to happen, well, then we might fall into line and be okay about it, okay? <laughs> and um, the how question is for the S's because we want to know how. We want dot points, thank you very much, or everything to know how to do it. Um, another thing about S types is that um, they're very modest and respectful, so they're not going to interrupt your conversation or talk over the top of you or um, that kind of thing, you know. They, they really do want to, they don't want the limelight. They, for me to be up here, I can tell you, I've had to dig into my S. So this is another thing about DISC. When you're doing personality program, uh, profiles, um, although they're great and they're accurate and all that jazz, but um, they say you are this and therefore you're not going to be good at that. Which is, all that does is just box a person in and it just gives them an elegant excuse to say, I can't do that then. I, I can't be organised. I can't be, I can't do this, I can't do that because I'm one of those people. Whereas with extended disc, it does show you that, um, I, I don't, actually don't have a copy of the uh, profile that comes out, but it shows you that you can actually extend yourself into another quadrant. So where I live is about here. Okay, so about there. Now, if I need to stretch myself, I can stretch myself there, I can stretch myself there. Those are stretches for me. This is quite easy. 
But I can't sustain that. I can't stay there. I have to come home to my comfort place. And that's the same with all of you. It doesn't matter which quadrant you're in. You can stretch yourself into another quadrant, but you're not going to stay there because it's unsustainable. You just get too tired and worn out and burnt out. You, you just, you have to honour what God has given you and the quadrant that you live in. You have to learn what are your strengths and then you have to tackle your stretches and not let anybody tell you that you can't do anything because we can all do all of this. We can all be in all four of these as Jesus was. You know, if you look at D, that's where Jesus would have been throwing them out of the temple. If you look at the, the I, that's where he would be turning wine into water, a water into wine and having a party at the wedding. Um, if you look at the S, that's where he would be saying, suffer the little children to come unto me. And if you look at the C, that's where he'd be saying in Jeremiah, I have a plan for you. So he's in all four of those, and so are we, because we're made in his image. So, um, yeah, that's the, the crucial difference between extended disc and all the other profilers out there, is that they box you in and tell you you can't do stuff, which is nonsense. Um, I'll just go through these. So the fears of the s -style is loss of stability. Um, any unplanned change that don't want to offend others, so they'd rather say nothing than offend someone. And this is where they can be used or, you know, stepped on or whatever. Um, usually they don't know how to say no, so they say yes to everything and then they end up getting overwhelmed and swamped. Um, so be logical with them provides support and always be fair. Fairness is huge for the mother archetype. Um, don't make unexpected changes, don't be impatient, and don't be unreliable. Now we come to the C. So this is the compliant one. Um, he's the one who wants to be right. When I say he wants to be right, or she, or the style, because we're not really talking about people, we're talking about um, a style um, of personality. Um, they want to be right, they want to be correct, they want to be accurate. Um, C's are very deep, so they're the technicians, the professors, the people who work in the laboratories, finding cures for cancer, all that kind of stuff. Um, they're very analytical, logical, um, and very disciplined. So, they're really hard to replace. If you have a C in your organisation, you're going to find it hard to replace them when they go on because although their scope of work is not really wide, it's very, very deep. So they, they will have a topic and they will know everything there is to know about that topic. Um, very, very deep. Um, they... Um, Yes, so the, their ideal roles are the data analysts, um, engineers, architects, all those kind of people, IT people, um, people who like to be left alone. Uh, they are guarded, they're reserved, um, and they don't really like interaction with people too much unless you're talking about something technical. Then they will have a conversation with you, but it needs to be something that's of interest to them. Um, they can come across as withdrawn and shy uh, and they really get stuck in the details because they are not pictured people. So it does become a problem um, when, you know, when they stop, when people want big picture stuff on them and they, they want to give you the detail. So they are our facts and figures people. Um, and they are motivated by the desire to be correct, to be right, to be accurate. Um, so what they fear is criticism of their work because their work is everything to them. They really and truly um, are very passionate about what they're doing. 
They don't want to make mistakes. They don't want to be wrong. They don't want to let the team down. Um, they don't like disorganisation. And if you have a CE working for you and you don't give them enough instruction, um, it's disastrous. They, they can go into their shell. So um, they become very critical if they're under pressure. So with the C, you need to listen carefully, even slow your speech down, um, because they take a long time to trust. You know, they're not just going to trust you right off the bat. So, you know, if you're a salesperson or something like that, and a C says to you, I need time to think about this. You know, I, I'm going to go home and I'm going to think about it. You let him go because he really does need time to think about it. They do not make on-spot decisions, you know. I mean, me, I see you and I buy, <laughs> but they don't. Um, so, uh, I read a story about a, um, a C guy um, and a, an I woman. So, they married a couple, they went off to the spa shop to go and buy a spa. She sees a spa, oh my gosh, she just loved it. She, she just looked at it and said, that's the one for me. She got in, lay on it, and said, this is the one for him. And he said, no, 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 no. Calls over the salesperson, he says, where are the technical details, please? I need all the specifications on this spa. <laughs> and only when he was happy with that did they buy it. But the thing is, is that if you're a savvy salesperson and you know this stuff, you can see the eye lying in the tub, and you can see the CEO over there going, no, 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 I want the technical details. You'll run and get in that technical sheet because that will get you the sale. So in sales, this knowledge is crucial, it's critical. And um, we, we take our girls through this as well, our sales girls, because they need to know who they're dealing with, they need to know how to treat them, they need to know how they enter their worlds, they need to know how to speak their language. Um, they also need to know that some people will buy straight away. They also need to know that some people do need time to think about things. Some people need to see something a couple of times or hear about it a couple of times before it clicks with them and they go, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to get one of those things. Um, and then you've got the eyes, the influencers who just buy everything on site. <laughs> Um, so, don't expect your decisions straight away. Don't spend time on small talk unless it's about technical details um, and give them the correct information. Uh, some other applications where um, extended disk is used is in all of these areas. Now, I use it in coaching and in recruitment. So, um, when I'm recruiting, I put them through like a, a mini disk profile, mini extended disk profile, uh, because that gives me a general idea. And then, if I'm going to take them on, I put them through the real thing. Um, what that does is give me a 32 page report and will show you exactly where that person will fit into the team, um, which is crucial, crucial knowledge if you want to have a happy and balanced team. So um, this is, if you want a balanced team, you should look at your team and if you don't have one of each person in, from the quadrant, you're probably going to have an unbalanced, unbalanced team. So every team I reckon needs a D because they are the ones that will get the results. They are the ones who will drive everything and, um, and they need to be in charge of and accountable for results. The eyes, you put them in uh, charge of, um, you know, the creative kind of stuff, the people stuff, the party stuff, um, and make them accountable for that. And that whole feel of people thing just goes a long, long way in any business. Um, the S's are the support people, so, you know, the S's are the one that you run to when, you know, you haven't got the right pay in your pay, on your pay slip or, um, you know, those kind of things. You really need good support people and, and the best ones are the S's. The C's are good as well, um, but they are more like, leave me alone, close the door, don't interrupt me, I'm doing the books. So 
those kind of people, they, they can be good support people as well. Um, but yeah, every team needs to try and be balanced. I know it's not always possible to have one of everybody in your team, but if you're looking at teams, that's the thing to do. So um, that's my little um, show <laughs> for tonight. Um, so I would just like to know um, if anybody's got any questions. Um, what did you love? What didn't you love? And um, yes. CD. Oh, okay, so now we're talking about blends. That CD blend is a brilliant blend, okay, because, because you've got um, the resourcefulness of the D and you've got the big picture thinking of the D and the bullet the gate of the D, but with the C you've got the precision, you've got the fine detail. Um, so that combination, so our daughter-in-law who works for us, Olivia, she is that DC combination. She is utterly amazing. She's an unbelievable person to have working for us because she just gets things done. But not only does she get them done, she gets them done to the nth degree as well. So, as I mentioned, there are lots of blends. Um, you've got your DI here, both extroverts and both big picture. That works really well for sales. Um, here you've got your IS, um, so these people, um, they work really well together with, you know, a customer service and all that kind of thing. Um, S and C work well together as back-end support too. But then you've got the opposites here, so you've got a C with an I, they make fantastic teachers because they've got the the charisma of the I and the detail of the C and they're actually able to make um, difficult things look really easy. You know, they, they're good teachers. Um, then you've got the D and the S, um, which is me and David in one body. <laughs> um, so it's actually a really good combination. It's quite rare but it's a really good combination because they balance each other out. So you've got um, the results driven the resourcefulness here, um, but with a bit of compassion as well. So um, that's that sort of is the blends. But there are, there are other blends as well, but those are the main ones. Oh, um, in the club I have got anywhere up to 50 girls working for me at any one time. Um, a lot of them are personal trainers that so come in and just do a class and go, but I've got a core staff of 20. Um, and it's taken a very long time to get this group of girls together, but they are amazing. I've just got the best team on the planet now. And a lot of it is due to this stuff. It's just looking at the team, plotting, where are they at? Who are they working with? Um, what are the styles? It really makes a huge difference to have the right people in the right place and working together in the groups. And it's just so harmonious. It's wonderful. Yes. Um, no. Um, so these two here at the top, the C and the D, they are a masculine energy. Now, when I'm saying energy, I'm not talking about you know, crystals and all that. And when I say masculine, I'm not talking about sexual either. So it's just a masculine energy. Um, and down here, you've got a feminine energy. So you can have guys that have got, well, we've both, we've all got, we've, we've all got both in us. Um, and so you'll find that with these two at the top being both the masculine energy, there's no mugging around there, okay? This is a bit softer down here because you've got the feminine touch and um, they blend really well, these two here. Here you've got masculine and feminine, so that just means that if there's a blend of these two, um, you're going to find that this 
Estyle is going to stand up for themselves a bit better because they've got that bit of masculine energy in them as well. Yeah, so it's not a gender thing as such. What's the difference between extended DISC and DISC? Oh, okay, so DISC, which is just the general disc, just measures your personality. So the extended disc measures your behaviour in certain circumstances and also your um, emotions. So when you see a DISC report, there are two um, graphs. So you've got one graph which measures your um, your natural state or your like your core being, as it were. And then you've got the other one that measures how you think the world perceives you. Um, you know, it's like that sort of putting on the mask thing. So when you're at home, this is who you are. But when you go out into the work workforce, this is who you think you have to be. And so therefore you put on the space. And the extended disc will pick that up. So it gives you two separate reports on that. And it shows you exactly where you are on the quadrant with your um, natural um, demeanor. And then it'll also show you where you are when you go out to work. And, and when you look at those, the differences between the two, you can see sometimes that some people like say for example it was me and I'm sort of an S for on C, SC. Um, if I was going to work and my work thing is showing up as D every day, you know there's a problem because I'm not going to be able to sustain it. I can't stay in that job for any length of time. And so that's how you can start to pinpoint um, when things are going to go wrong in your team by looking at the two profiles and working out where they are. Now, also, if um, so, the lines of the graph, you know, if they go right down or they drop down a certain percentage, it starts to tell you that there's a theme. So, it might be a theme of insecurity, um, it might be, there's all kinds of, there's 10 different themes that you can pick up from extended disc. So, that's the difference between general disc and extended disc. Uh, general disc will just tell you you're a D, that's it. Or an ad, or a line, etc. Yeah, you were speaking to couples. Do you normally like, gravitate to someone as a super personality and does it make the church smoother or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, opposites usually attract. <laughs> I can vouch for that. Um, yeah, you know, the thing is, is that it's fine to be opposites. Um, because life would be pretty boring if everybody was the same. Um, it's knowing how to handle it. It's knowing, um, it's knowing what that personality is about and knowing that some of the things I do they actually don't mean. You know, and sometimes people take such offence, they get so offended, so wounded, so hurt when they don't really need to because that person actually didn't mean that. And they're sitting there going, what? You know, what was that all about? So if you just kind of have that bit of understanding, um, then you could say, you know what, really hurt me when you did that, please don't do it again. And, and, and you could then bring it back to, this is who I am, and you know, I don't like that kind of thing. So it's, it's learning to empathize um, with each other. Yeah, I think I think it would if you looked into it carefully enough. Yeah, it would. Yeah. Does anybody else have any more questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much for having me tonight. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you very much. My yes. Thank you. <laughs> There's a crazy thing, I remember many years ago we were a whole church did a personality profile of some kind, the pastor was very good at it. And I'd never seen, I didn't even know anything about personalities, even though I had one. <laughs> and uh, at the, the end of it, I figured out that I was a deep and nothing else. And so um, the pastor was then telling us you know, what, what each one meant, I was sitting next to Berlin. And he told us what the D's were, and I thought that was such a bad dude. And I said to him, man, why on earth did you 
marry me? I'm such a horrible creature. And she said, no, you do have your good points. <laughs> but I, I figured I'd better change some stuff. So I actually set about changing my ways. Because I would say stuff to her like, why did you do that, you moron? And, but I, didn't, I don't mean just moron, it's just like, you know, you morons do stuff like that. You know? <laughs> teach you stuff on the marketplace. From what we've learned over the years, building big, big companies, and the hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars and so on. So that you get the frontline spiritual side of uh, kingdom from the marketplace activity. And then after the next break, you come back with something practical. And that's been the model of practical teaching that Merle has just given you. Um, over the years, perhaps the last two years, we've drifted a little bit. So we, we've had inspiration speakers and speakers focusing more on stuff in the marketplace and stuff at higher political levels and things like that. But we would like to get back to where we could have practical input all the time because it's so beneficial. And you normally, if you were getting that in the marketplace, it would be quite expensive. Okay. So with that in mind also, please, if you want professional intercession, guys, please speak to Pastor Suzette. She's, you know, I see what she does in Australia and, and now with, with clients around the world. And then I see other intercessors around the world because I'm all over the world all the time. The standard here is miles and miles ahead. And I know that I'm just piping up to because I get often uh, so many people say, Dave, we, you know, we need to pray for you and so on and so on. But this is the best that I've ever come across you guys. So absolutely a lot of you would know that. So if you want professional intercession, professional being paid. Um, I know that might sound a bit strange, but to, to, to an untrained mind, but it's absolutely essential in my mind. We go into the marketplace, stick your head above the radar, it's going to get shot off if you haven't got yeah, you need to know what's coming back and what's going on. Okay. So that's awesome. Um, the other thing I forgot to do was put up a slide on the Kingdom Investors website. If you want to join the membership site, it's kingdominvestors.com.au. It is a $20, 20 US a month. Um, but there's teaching there is amazing stuff and the feedback we've had is amazing. So we intend to build the world's first sheep nation here in Australia and then use it as benchmark for other nations to follow. There are nations now all over the world following us. There are members from all over the world, and there are those that are competing with us. In Samoa, it was there last year, and they said we are going to beat you. They are competitive, they are on the rugby field. And I said, You've never met the Rhodesians, but man, we are going to follow you. And that is, I was lecturing to about 300 pastors there, and they were ganged up on me, and they've been good. So there's competitions going around the world now, which is a good thing. Does anybody have any final questions before I ask? <laughs> yes. Sheep goat nation. Okay. The in Matthew 25, it's called the final judgment. It's a passage in the Bible called the final judgment. Now know that at that point in time, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and um, a lot of people will say it's an end time eschatology of Jews talking to Jews. Jesus was a Jew. Okay. So at the end of the day, here's Jesus talking to the disciples and he's telling them what the kingdom of God should look like on the earth. And he's telling them that when he returns is what he expects to find. And how the, how the nations or the ethnic groups of the world, because the word for nations is ethnos, how they should be or what will happen to them if they do and if they don't comply with what he's talking about. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that's an essence end time eschatology uh, was perceived to be is because it does appear throughout the Bible. Okay, so my point is it's not only for the end times, it's not only for the Jews. You'll find it throughout the Bible. You'll find it in Isaiah 58, you'll find it throughout the book of James. It's all over the Bible. There's hundreds and hundreds of scriptures talking about what the concept of the sheep nation is. So, to bring that uh, into, into a practical sense, 
there's a society that disciples, when I come back, the nations of the world will be lined up and split up between sheep and goats. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. The sheep nations will be taken into heaven, essentially, where the place that the Lord set up for them, and the goat nations are going to go where it's quite warm. Okay, so that's the, that's the basis of what they're saying. So what constitutes a sheep nation, what constitutes a goat nation? You read it, Matthew 35. Let me put it this way first. Every nation on earth is a goat nation at this point in time. Literally. Jesus came back, you know, it's, it's going to be a problem, so we don't need him coming back soon. We need to fix some stuff first. But at the end of the day, what he's saying is that you, we need to look after the poor, we need to look after the homeless, we need to look after the prisoners, we need to look after this, look after that, and so on and so on. And he says to these people, you guys have done this for me, therefore you are the sheep nations on the right. And the people say to him, well, when did we do that to you? And he said, well, whenever you did it to one of these people, one of the poor people, and so on. Okay? And then he says to the goat nations, and you guys are goat nations, you're going to go where it's warm. And they say, well, why? And he said, because you did nothing. Okay? Because you read it carefully, it's because you did not do what these people did. So in other words, you did nothing about the human suffering, and human distress, and human misery. So we extrapolate that from first century Palestine and bring it into the modern era. <coughs> it's quite clear to see who he's talking about. It's all the social distress issues that God cares about, about my father's concerns. Okay? So when you're talking about you know, the strangers in the Bible, we're talking about the refugees in the modern era. Refugees in the world. There are millions of them. And, and we should be looking after them. I'm not saying we should crash our borders and we should come here tomorrow. I'm talking about we should be thinking, given that we're the top 5% of wealthiest people on earth, every one of us in this country, why is this going on in these countries? Why are refugees? What is the root cause of them? Let's collectively attend to that. That is how you fix the refugee problem. Yes, we can fix the symptoms and so on, looking after people. But that's what he's saying. If you, if you do nothing, then you're a part of a goat nation. If he's talking about looking after the widows in the modern era, widows are generally men and women, girls and boys are all well educated, so it's not the same, it's not literally the same. A widow in the modern era, well, a widow in the olden days was a woman or a female who had lost her male protector. Okay? So there was no kinsman redeemer, there's probably no sons, and there's a woman without a protector. She's going to have to be a prostitute more than likely. She's going to have, might have her own micro business. But most of them, while they're still young, have to be prostitutes are going to get abused, not going to get paid, all sorts of things are going to go wrong with them. In the modern era, women who are widows often have means and are all smart, intelligent, educated. So it's a different world. They weren't educated in those days. But what does it look like? A woman or a female with no male protector in the modern era is pretty much those little 12 year old girls that are getting nailed by 15 to 20 men every night of their lives just so that they can eat right here in this country right around the developed world and the third world and so on. You know, they found over 20,000 of those young girls in Mali the other day, Nigerian girls who were kidnapped, over 20,000 of them, all being used as sex slaves from 12 years old. Nobody wants them back. Now they're 16, now they're on their second kid. No, Nigeria doesn't want them back. They make some rubbish effort to do it, but they don't want them back because nobody wants them. So this goes on everywhere. So those are the widows of the modern era. And then there's the poor, and then there's the homeless and all the others. You can bring it all into the modern era, and it's our job to do stuff. Now, the biggest deal of everything here, guys, especially for the new people, we can, there's orphans everywhere. We, we can build orphanages until the cows come home. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't stop the flow of orphans. We need to go after the root cause, and that's what the core of the sheep nation concept is, to fix the culture of greed and self centeredness that creates all of us here. And change it into the culture that she's that no man's got in front of, a culture of caring and sharing, where everybody flourishes in that club. And there's all sorts of bad things. Berlin says to me, the worst thing in the world is trying to run that look after a thousand plus ladies plus all fifty employees. It's like burning cats across the river in the, during a cyclone. You know. But the point is she's done it because she changed the culture and now they just flock there and they love the place and, and they flourish there. So she went after the root cause and put the culture of selfishness and cattiness and all the stuff that self centeredness that goes on. She fixed all of that. So we can do that at any level, do that in our business, in our family, in our community, and so on. And we do that all the time. We do it in our businesses, and we do it, you know, in everything we do. And the mindset should be that the basic fundamental mindset of sheep nation is that every transaction and every interaction that we have with everybody and anybody. 
we should we should strive to make sure that everybody prospers within that transaction or interaction. So if we're doing business, I want all of my capital partners to prosper. I want my investors to prosper. I want everybody that touches our business to prosper because then wealth becomes infinite. We all, we all grow together, we all rise with the tide. And we have made scores of millionaires from very poor people. We touched our company, we made them wealthy. Okay? It's not just about wealth. Obviously, we, we teach those people why we're doing it and why they should do the same. But ultimately, it's all about caring and sharing. It's counterintuitive economically, but it works and it's sustainable and it's the only world that works and it's sustainable. So those are the fundamentals of the Sheep Nation. And if we do that, even in a corrupt city like Durban, as I mentioned earlier, it's entirely doable. We just have to prove the concept. And then as you prove it, even the most crooked, horrible, Robert Mugabe type person who trashed the nation and, and starved his people out so he could build his own palaces, is going to look and say, wow, I'll even do better if I do it your way. Even though I'm a greedy crook, I'll do it that way. Why wouldn't they do it that way? Because they, they get rid of the potential of an insurrection against them. And that's the model of machine nation. So it practically works on the ground. And that's why I'm saying we're leading the world charge because we are actually proving the concept works. Okay? Just a case now of teaching so many people that we reach it's a big point to change the culture. <coughs> this country, 25 million people, <coughs> excuse me, we need to reach around about 1.5 million, about 6%. You know, if we're usually a tipping point would be ten percent of the population, but just we're dealing with business people that much more purposefully minded. Hopefully, there are these, and then we'll get it all done much quicker. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it done by Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the relational ones can pick up the pieces. <laughs> they can run the old pictures. <laughs> Faster, is it? It's quite a concept, isn't it? We're going to clean it up by Friday and then we can pick up the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Father God, we just want to say thank you. Father, thank you for your love and thank you for your wisdom. Father, thank you for the covenant that we have with you, Father, and an unfailing covenant, a covenant that doesn't end, a covenant that goes on and on, a covenant that is sure and secure through Jesus Christ and the power of his shed blood. So, Father, we stand in that covenant here today, and we stand before you, and, Father, we declare right now that we are in alignment with your purposes, we're in alignment with your will, we come into alignment with what you have decreed for us, for our nation, for our towns, our cities, and our families. And so, Father, as we come into alignment with you, as we stand in covenant, we remember you. And we thank you, Father, that you will release everything that we need. We thank you, Father, that you release ideas, concepts, insights, discernment. You release resources. You release the freedom of ideas to come forth, Father. We thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost at work in our nation to bring conviction to people that, that are catalysts for change. But, Father, we stand before you right now, and, Father, we ask, that first of all, in us, anything that is of selfishness, anything of greed, anything of insecurity, anything where we're hoarding for ourselves and not thinking of others, Father, deal with us. Because we can't take the log out of a splinter out of someone else's eye for logs in ours. So, Father, tonight we stand before you and we've heard the cry from the heart of God for a sheep nation. And we've heard, Father, what you've required. So we say, first of all, Father, deal with us. By the power of your Spirit, deal with us. In your grace and in your mercy, circumcise our lives. Cut away everything that displeases you. Cut away, Father, the, the wrong mindsets that just cut away what is not of you. That we truly would be living sacrifices, surrendered to you, obedient to you, compliant with you. That would stay in the pace of grace and in, a, in agreement with heaven. Father, we come before you and we say it's a huge job. Even to sometimes getting the cash flow in the company is huge. Turning Australia into a sheep nation is huge, but Father, with you all things are possible. 
So we ask right now, give us the process, give us the strategy, give us the runs on the board more than we have. Father God, that you would position us, that you give us a heart and a mind to follow after this. That Father God, that we would be able to step in, that things would change. Father, I pray that we would rise up, rise up in who we are, rise up in our true identity, rise up in our, our dominion authority and walk in the power of Jesus Christ. Release the power of his name. Release the power of the blessing in our land and in our businesses. Father, Father God, we come before you and we say in the name of Jesus Christ, not on our watch will we surrender anything. We surrender nothing to the enemy, but we take ground every day for the kingdom of God. And so in Jesus' name, Satan, we remind you that you are under our feet, that every step that we take, God gives us the ground that we walk upon. You are under our feet. You must submit to the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And so I ask, Father, in Jesus' name, heavenly solutions for earthly challenges. Give us the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God for the root issues that must be dealt with. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was an awesome talk, love. So that was number one. So please, guys, put your hands again for Mary. Are you guys enjoying tonight? Good? Okay, good. So we'll be back in two months' time. So are you still doing the Bethel Business Team? Uh, so 4th of April, the Bethel Business Team are coming here. They, they, they are the ones who live on the throne. So, and, and is it yes? Is it the same building? Yeah, what a miracle. And then a month later, we'll play again. God bless you.